Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Blogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible Truth series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse, for the purpose of uh, helping us all to understand the Bible better, um, so that we can uh, have a firm footing when we need to give a defense of our faith, uh, so that we have that familiarity with God's Word, so that when someone asks us uh, a question, that we will be better equipped to answer it. So this is why we do what we do. Once again, I want to thank you all for, for tuning in here, taking the time to do this. I know that uh, you have many other things you could be doing, but instead you have chosen to spend this time here with me and the Lord. And uh, I promise you it will not be time wasted. I believe that uh, uh, spending time in God's Word has great rewards, great dividends, um, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Um, you know, that... Uh, you know, taking the time to know God, you know, um, to find out why he does things the way he does to, you know, to, to seek to know about him. And of course you can, you can seek, you can find out about him from his word. You can find out about him through his interactions with the people in the word or the things that the people in the word say about him. Um, I mean, it's kind of like a second-hand account, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you can, you can, you know, if you were, uh, you know, if you were ever dating someone and you wanted to know more about them, you know, you ask their family, okay, well, what were they like when they were uh, this age or that age? And you want to find out, you know, and you want to see the family albums, you want to see the pictures, you know, you want to, you want to get to know them. And uh, what better way to get to know God than to spend time in his word? Find out how he interacted with people in the past, why he did, why he did what what he did, because really that's what this is about is is uh, delighting in his word. If you delight in his word, you're delighting in him, because as we've said many times, first first John chapter one, Jesus Christ is the word. He you know he's the word made flesh, and so um, let's go ahead and pray. That because I just that was just kind of an opening thought. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll jump in. Um, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that uh, you're in it, that you're through it, and that you use it to uh, to enlarge our heart, to to uh, to instruct our heart, inform our spirit man, uh, as the word says that that hidden man of the heart. I thank you that uh, you're developing us through your word, and uh, you are lighting up our life through your word. I thank you, Father, for that. I ask that you would give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation. And the knowledge of you, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, um, strengthening us in the inner man that you, you've made uh, within us. I thank you for that. I ask that you would uh, bless our time here as we, uh, as we go through the word and we meditate upon it and uh, give us the revelation that we need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So uh, we are in Second Chronicles and we're looking at uh, chapter 19. Uh, this is the chapter 19 and the last the last part of the reign of King Jehoshaphat of Judah who was a good king um, he had he left a very good example to follow I do have a verse part of a verse highlighted out here in chapter 20 we have part of verse 24 highlighted out and again that's just because uh, the, the language there is a uh, as graphic and you know we want to um, honor those of you who may have little listening ears with you and uh, so let's go ahead and, and uh, jump in. So Second Chronicles 19. When King Jehoshaphat of Judah arrived safely home in Jerusalem, because this takes place just after that big battle with King Ahab, uh, Jehoshaphat acted as Ahab's ally. Um, but as we found out, uh, Ahab, uh, you know, suffered wounds in the battle and died of his wounds, uh, which was a part of God's plan, but Ahab would not listen. Didn't have to end that way, but Ahab would not listen. So now Jeho Jehoshaphat's, uh, Jehoshaphat's re arrived home. So verse 2, Jehu, son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. Why should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? He asked the king. Because of what you have done, the Lord is very angry with you. Even so, there is some good in you, for you have removed the Asherah poles throughout the land, and you have committed yourself to seeking God. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, but he went out among the people, traveling from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim, encouraging the people to return to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. He appointed judges throughout the nation and in all the fortified towns, and he said to them, Always think carefully before pronouncing judgment. 
Remember that you do not judge to please people, but to please the Lord. He will be with you when you render the verdict in each case. Fear the Lord and judge with integrity. For the Lord our God does not tolerate perverted justice, partiality, or the taking of bribes. And that's a good word, you know, and, and uh, he is reiterating what God had talked about, or what, what God had uh, um, uh, agreed with to institute back in, in Moses' time. You know, uh, Moses was doing God's work, but he was um, he was going beyond what he was physically able to, to endure. Um, you know, uh, judging cases for the people from morning until night, um, and then his father-in-law Jethro came and said, what you're doing is not good, you're going to wear yourself out, you're going to wear the people out, and he said, if it seems good to you, and it, see, and it seems good to the Lord, he was like, a ju uh, appoint judges to handle these matters, and he said, you need to appoint men who are uh, full of wisdom and who hate bribes, and so Jehoshaphat is reiterating this, he's doing a good job, and it seems like he's almost doing this in response to what the seer, what the prophet said to him, that because he, he helped Ahab in his war, and Ahab was a wicked king. And you can see that Jehoshaphat's heart was for the people to return to the Lord, and so he is seeking to win them through kindness. And while that's a good a good path, it's possible, you know, when you when you do that method, it's possible for uh, wicked people to try to entice you to follow their ways. You know, they, you know, they, some of them will just reject you, but others will kind of buddy a buddy up to you and try to get you to start compromising. And we saw that happen with Ahab. That's why he gets this warning that, you know, why should you um, help the wicked and love those who, who hate the Lord? You know, that it was obvious that Ahab didn't want to repent, yet Jehoshaphat was still uh, investing time and resources into him. And uh, so he gets a rebuke and he seems to listen. So in verse 8, in Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites and priests and clan leaders in Israel to serve as judges for cases involving the Lord's regulations and for civil disputes. These were his instructions to them. Uh, you must always act in the fear of the Lord, with faithfulness and an, an, an undivided heart. Whenever a case comes to you from fellow citizens in an outlying town, whether a murder case or some other violation of God's laws, commands, decrees or regulations, you must warn them not to sin against the Lord, so that he will not be angry with you and, and them. Do this, and you will not be guilty. So in other words, uh, instruct people on what's right, and after that, that's between them and God, whether they do what they're supposed to do or not. But in other words, it's like, I've done my part. I, you know, I'm, I'm not accountable because I warned you like I was supposed to do. And yeah, and yeah, they're they're clan leaders, they're 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 serving as judges, they should be doing exactly what he's telling them. Verse eleven, Amariah the high priest will have final say in all cases involving the Lord. Zebediah, son of Ishmael, a leader from the tribe of Judah, will have final say in all civil cases. The Levites will assist you in making sure that justice is served. Take courage as you fulfill your duties, and may the Lord be with those who do what is right. Yeah, good words. Chapter 20. After this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Mayunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazon Tamar. This is another name for En Gedi. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Now we talked about fasting before, but I'll just touch on it again just to reiterate. Fasting doesn't change God. Fasting doesn't change what God wants. It doesn't change um, the way he thinks. It doesn't change his plans. Um, it may change how he enacts his plans. Because over, you know, overall, God's going to work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Romans chapter 8. But... Uh, fasting changes me. If I'm fasting properly, if I am fasting for the purpose of seeking God, uh, for um, drawing near to Him, then this changes my heart, and it's now put me into a better position to receive the things that God wants me to have in the first place. Okay, uh, because it it increases my faith. It it, it helps me. Uh, to be able to trust God better, because really fasting is about learning to trust God. Because, you know, when um, you know that's the most basic thing, you know, uh, is is food. You know, so it's like I, 
you know, if I'm if I'm well fed, uh, then I'm not necessarily thinking about about God. But if I'm if I'm hungry, then and I'm not talking about fasting, but if I'm hungry, I don't have enough to eat, and I don't have then I'm I'm gonna cry out to God for help. And so, but this idea of fasting is a step above that, where I am choosing to withhold food from my body. Um, and the time that I would have spent eating, I'm spending with the Lord. And so I am not relying on him in terms of survival, but I am relying on him for sustenance of my heart, my spirit. And so there's that uh, aid then that um, when I do that, I'm drawing close to God. And so my heart is now in a, in a more receptive position to hear from him um, because I am seeking him uh, in conjunction with trusting him, if that makes sense. And so I heard, uh, I heard a minister talking about it one time and it was funny. He, he's like, you don't think that, that food cries out to you? Try fasting for a couple of days. And pretty soon those, those chips are, are calling out to you from the cabinet, you know? And I thought that's, that's true, you know? So, uh, verse five, uh, well, I guess verse four. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. That's interesting. They traveled for the purpose of fasting and seeking God's help. That that shows devotion. So verse 5, Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. O our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. And now, See what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt, so they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they, are re they reward us, for they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. O Lord, uh, oh, excuse me, O our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. And you see this, this prayer is heartfelt. Um, Jehoshaphat is humbling himself before God. He is at, genuinely asking for God's help. And he is reminding God in the, that he's reminding him, not only in the past did you drive out nations before us, but you gave, the, you gave us this land as an inheritance. And you said we were supposed to be here. Um, and he also reminds God uh, just, you know, about like these, these three nations. God did tell Moses on the way in, if you remember when we read it, God, there were certain nations that God said, I haven't given you any of their land. Do not attack them. Respect those borders. And so he's like, we spared these people when we came, and now they're coming to attack us. They're coming to dislodge us from this land that you gave us. And so um, Jehoshaphat is, is bringing up a lot of good points. This is what we would call the prayer of petition. You know, this is, he is, he is petitioning God for help. He is not saying that God is unjust. He is not complaining against God. He is saying uh, there are certain things that you told us, God, and look at this army that's coming to violate this covenant that you made with us, you know. And so um, look at the heart with which he brings forth this petition. I, I, and uh, he, he does a very good job of not condemning God, um, not blaming God for the situation that they're in, and really telling God, we're completely relying on you. We we don't even know what to do. We we have no idea what to do. We need your help. And so just, I, I love his heart. So verse 13, As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Beniah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite, who was a descendant of Asaph. He said, Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz.
at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. And so, you know, we, we love, this is one of the, the verses that we love to quote. You know, Christians quote this all the time. The battle's not yours, the battle belongs to the Lord. And, and while that's true, many times uh, people say it without knowing where it's found in, in the word. So again, you know, one of the reasons we do this is to uh, to promote a familiarity with God's word, um, you know, to have a uh, kind of develop a roadmap in our heart about where things are located and uh, just just know know the word well, you know, just know. Um, yeah, that's that's in, you know Second Chronicles. I, I noticed that you know when I was pastoring and I had to study uh, the scriptures for sermon preparation, I started to kind of. It's like, yeah, I know what book that's. I mean, before it would be like, yeah, I know what book this passage is located in. But as I was doing that, I started to, to it's like, okay, that's in the beginning of that book. Or that's uh, somewhere around this chapter. You know, in, so, in some cases I could I could narrow down the verse. And that was just through um, being in the Word a lot. Just being in it and, and starting to become familiar with where things are located, you know. and the, And we have scriptures that we have a sort of like landmarks in the word that we that people love to quote you know um uh like uh no weapon formed against us will prosper well a lot of christians can't point to where that is you know um uh, uh nothing else really comes to oh yeah my god shall supply all your riches according to glory uh, according to uh, my god shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory and it's like well where is that located well that's in philippians and i remember that's in, that's in philippians but, um, you know, it's good to know. See, because if you know where it's located, you know where the landmarks are, um, you know, then then you have a firm footing. You know, you, you, you have an understanding of God's word. Not only do you know what you believe, but you know why you believe it. And you know how to articulate what you believe and why it's so firmly written in your heart. You know, so that's a good thing. So anyway, he says... Uh, the, the, he's prophesying the battle's not yours but God's. Well, it, it is God's battle, and, real, and it is true in a general sense that every battle that we fight does belong to the Lord because Jesus is the one that won the victory for us. We're just enforcing it. That's what he meant when he said, Behold, I give you authority over snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He didn't say, I gave you power over the enemy. Then you would be able to conquer territory that's not yet, not yet conquered. But he said, I give you authority over snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. How did Jesus acquire that power over all, over the enemy? He defeated him. And Jesus granted us uh, the privilege of sharing in his victory. And how we do that is by uh, using the authority he has given us in his name to enforce it. And so, uh, but so specifically speaking, it, it, this is like, this is God's battle. Why? Because God specifically spared these peoples who are now coming against his people to try to dislodge them from the land that he gave them. So God's like, yeah, I'm going to enforce my covenant. I'm going to make sure that they don't move you because this is the land I gave you. You know, and uh, I mean, that's a paraphrase, of course, but that's but you can see that that's why God's doing this. And, uh, you know, God gave them knowledge. I mean, he gave them knowledge they wouldn't have otherwise had. They're, they're coming. He told them what their battle route is. He's like, they're coming up um, through that that valley. Um, and so, but he says, you're not even going to need to fight because David would ask God, shall we go up to fight them? And God would say, yay or nay. And sometimes God would give them specific instructions, but typically he would give them victory over whatever army was attacking them for, and they, but they still had to fight. In this case, he's like, you don't even have to fight. I'll take care of it. So verse 18, then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. That's an appropriate response. It's, it's appropriate to honor God at all times, but uh, a, a greater level of honor is, is, uh, is appropriate to show him when he does something like this, when he's given um, such a profound word. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped. 
and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. And I've heard many messages on this. You know, I've uh, been in church a long time, heard lots of ministers. You know, like, oh, it's just great that he sent the singers out ahead of the army. The only reason he sent the singers out ahead of the army is because God told him, you will not have to fight. <laughs> in other words, Jehoshaphat was not being flippant with the lives of his people. He wasn't taking a risk. He, he was like, God, God told me we won't have to fight. So let's send the singers out ahead to praise God. And I, it, so he, it wasn't like he just decided to do this. He, he did it in response to, some, to a word that God had spoken that he put his faith in. Verse 22, at that very moment they began to sing, or at the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and destroyed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. And then the last uh, sentence of tw verse 24 says, Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. Verse 25, King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. That is a vast amount of spoil. You know, and a side note, you know, I um, I heard a message by Kenneth e. Hagin one time that really spoke a lot about, he, and he, he titled it Gathering the Spoil, Gathering Up the Spoil. And he's right in, uh, so, well, he is right, but I didn't explain what he said just yet. But I'll, so I'll, I'll go back. And he, so he talked about how, it says in the New Testament that Jesus um, made a show openly of Satan and his cohorts when he, when he rose from the dead, he defeated them. But uh, depending on the translation you read, it says he he despoiled them. In other words, not only did he he dethrone them and strip them of all of their authority and power over believers, but he he despoiled them. He he uh, any anything that because the devil steals, kills, and destroys. So he has stolen things from people all over the world, and so God has now freed up those things that he has stolen. And so, uh, and, and it speaks to spiritual things, but it also speaks to natural things. But we can take that and apply that and understand that this is, in a sense, a similar thing. Um, this army has been despoiled, and now it's taking them three days to gather up all of the spoil um, that, that, uh, that the, they brought with them. So then, verse 26, on the fourth day they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It is still called the Valley of Blessing today. See, because um, to praise and worship God blesses him. You know, um, it, it's like uh, I had an instructor that was talking about when Jesus took the loaves and the fish and he broke them and um, he, he blessed. It's in, in, in a Jewish mindset, it would be blessing God for what they were about to receive so it's like he took the bread and he blessed and then he began to break it and pass it around so it's a, it's a it's a vertical understanding instead of rather than from person to person but we are blessing god when we praise him it blesses his heart so it's the valley of blessing it's not a it's not the valley of blessing because of all the spoil it was a valley of blessing because they praised god <laughs> so verse 27 then all the men returned to jerusalem with Jehoshaphat leading them, overjoyed that the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They marched into Jerusalem to the music of harps, lyres, and trumpets, and they proceeded to the temple of the Lord. This is appropriate, giving thanks. Giving thanks. Verse 29, When all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, the fear of God came over them. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for God had given him rest on every side. So Jehoshaphat ruled over the land of Judah. He was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 25 years. His mother was Azuba, the daughter of Shalhai. Jehoshaphat was a good king, following the way of his father Asa. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. During his reign, however, 
he failed to remove all the pagan shrines, and the people never fully committed themselves to follow the god of their ancestors. The rest of the events of Jehoshaphat's reign, from beginning to end, are recorded in the record of Jehu son of Hanani, which is included in the book of the kings of Israel. Sometime later, King Jehoshaphat of Judah made an alliance with King Ahaziah of Israel, who was very wicked. Together they built a fleet of trading ships at the port of Ezion Geber. Then Eliezer, son of Dodavahu, from Merishah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat. He said, Because you have allied yourself with King Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy your work. So the ships met with disaster and never put out to sea. So that was um, one area that Jehoshaphat was weak in, is, is in his alliances. He, he made poor alliances. I think he was, what he was trying to do was win the kingdom of Israel back to God, but their kings were wicked and they would not they would not listen and so um he made some compromises that didn't that never took away his reputation of being a good king and and doing what was right and pleasing in god's sight but he went a little too far and and uh caused himself some some pain some harm uh in trying to uh investing too much in people who were not willing to listen i think that's a good way to, to put that and a good way to end this so i thank you father god for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you for everyone once again who tunes in here. I ask that you would bless them. I ask, Lord God, that you would help us to apply the lessons that we have learned here to our lives. And uh, I thank you for that. And in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.